Good morning, church, and Merry Christmas. Indeed, we are in this Christmas season, and so you see the church still adorned with all the beauty that um, has accompanied us on this journey. I even lit all the candelabra because the Christmas season lasts for 12 days, and it is wonderful to share in that time together. Um, I want to say a special thank you to Siobhan Santini and any of her helpers that helped make this sanctuary so beautiful for this time. Um, I know even Siobhan was here every few days watering the plants so that they would remain evergreen. And so I thank you so much, Siobhan, and for all of your helpers for the gift that you gave us in this sacred space. I also want to remind you, indeed, that we are in this Christmas season all the way to January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany, when we remember the visit of the three kings. Um, that is this Wednesday, January 6th, and it also happens to be my ordination anniversary, and I will be 18 years ordained a priest uh, on this Wednesday. So I hope that you will find reason to celebrate. There seems like a lot in my book to celebrate on that day. I want to also say thank you to our neighborhoods for the neighborhoods particularly that helped make Christmas dinners that were delivered to various shelters possible. We had three neighborhoods that collected paper goods and decorations and games to be distributed along with the food to the various shelters that we have supported over the years. So I want to say thank you to the Philip neighborhood and Lisa Calderi's leadership there. I want to say thank you to the Simon neighborhood and to Eileen McIntyre and her leadership there, and to the Bartholomew neighborhood and Allison Zuckert and her leadership there. So um, this is one of our first forays into neighborhood collective efforts, and I am immensely grateful for the ways that these three neighborhoods have lived into that. Um, I hope that you will discover some ways to connect with your neighbors in the days and weeks to come. A couple of things coming up um, today. For the first time, we are going to have a coffee chat with the rector. This is something completely different. It's not a town hall. It's not a meeting. It's not a coffee hour. It is a time of fellowship and um, spiritual conversation about the ministry that we carry out as the church, knowing that we together are the body of Christ, we together are the church, and so it is that we can still carry forth in the call that God has for us, even when we can't gather here on this particular space. So um, today at 1130, I hope you'll join. Um, the Zoom link was in Thursday's eblast that came out last Thursday, and um, I really, I am I'm really encouraging you to be there with me. I'm looking forward to um, this kind of conversation and spiritual conversation that we can have together. Lastly, I want to remind you of one other thing today, which is a conversation, well, not a conversation, but the beginning of a book study um, of Bishop Curry's re most recent book, Love is the Way. Um, I understand this has been getting a lot of airtime recently in the news, and why not? Because we need love to be the way, especially as we set out in this 2021 year. So. Um, Today at 4 o'clock, if you would like to watch the interview of our presiding bishop with the rector of Christ Church Greenwich, Merrick Zabriskie, then I will be showing that and we'll do a group watch via Zoom. And that will be at 4 p.m. today. Again, if you would like to participate in that, the link, the Zoom link is in the Thursday e-blast. Additionally, you can watch it on your own time. You can just go to Christ Church Greenwich's um, website and find it there and watch it at your leisure. But today at 4 o'clock, you have the opportunity, if you would like, to watch with me. And, um, and then I want to encourage you to pick up this book to read during this cold month of January. We have copies at the office for $20 if you want to purchase it from the church. Or, of course, you can get it your own way. I know that lifelong learners, our um, 65 and older um, book group, did this book a couple of months back and has spoken so highly of that experience. So please join me in finding out how love is the way, how we can allow love to be the way, how we can participate in love's way um, as we encounter this book together and have a chance to dialogue about it in the coming weeks. Lastly, I want to thank those who are helping make worship possible here in this space with me this morning. Of course, Jonathan and Alcy, who are as true as rain um, and are here all the time and bring their best to help make possible what we do together. And then thank you to Vivian, who is singing this morning. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds and open ourselves to what it is that God has to offer us as we come together in worship and praise of him.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you, you all, all hearts, hearts are, are open, open all, all desires, desires known, and, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Also with you. Let us pray. O God, who wonderfully created and what and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe. The word of the Lord. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are they the desolate valley. 
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the wise men who had come from the east had departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt have I called my son. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Unfold the living word for us today. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. The scriptures are a record of God's relationship with God's creation. 
from the very beginning to the very end. You hear and see event and occurrence and occasion where God relates to that which he has created. And you see how that relationship grows and how it is shaped and how it is that creation is um, shaped in relationship to God who is love. The longer that I serve in ministry, fostering people's relationship with God through the scriptures and our tradition, I'm intrigued by the way that we relate to the scriptures. How it is that some things seem so evident to us and others seem not so clear. How it is that sometimes we can have blindness as we engage the living word. When I look at this passage from the Gospel of Matthew this morning, I see here a family that has traveled in political exile. In threat of their life have they sought refuge in a foreign land. This, of course, would not be the first time that God's people had done this. For you recall that Joseph, when he was working for um, the Pharaoh in Egypt, he welcomed God's people into Egypt so that they would not starve in the famine. So it is that we see that there are occurrences, occasions, brought on by circumstances in the world in which people move to a place for safety and for life. It's not a surprise to me that people have recalled this piece of scripture when they have looked around the world in our present day and seen people who are moving about for safety because the land in which they live is not a place in which they can live. We see refugees and political exiles all over the globe time and again, and our heart is warmed and moved to listen and to respond to their need as best we can, knowing that indeed our Lord, Jesus Christ, was one such as these. And yet when we look at this scripture, rarely do I hear people talk about Joseph's conversation with God and how it is that God warns him in a dream, not once, not twice, but three times does God communicate with Joseph in a dream. It's as if this part is just flat, lifeless on a page. Rarely do we talk about it, but today I want to. How is it that God communicates with God's people? How is it that God re reaches out to us and encourages us to listen and respond to the agency that God is? For any one of us would want the clues that Joseph was given for his life and health and safety, not only of himself, but of his wife and newborn child. Any one of us would want to be warned of the way that Joseph was warned so that we might be saved from the perils that were certain to come. But what is it then that prevents us from considering Joseph's dream? Maybe it's a little hard to imagine. Like, was it a literal dream? an actual dream that happened in the night? Did he wake up, like we do sometimes, and know that he'd had a dream, and known that there was something in the dream, but he wasn't really quite sure what it was? The scriptures don't tell us that. Or was it a dream that was more in like a liminal space, like that spot when you're falling into sleep or out of sleep, coming to awakeness? When a certain truth grabs you at the very core of your being and you know something so clearly, how could you not have seen it before? Was that the way that it came to Joseph? Or did it come to him in a type of meditation where he was sitting in silence, open to God's action in him, attuning himself to listen? Was that how it is that it came to him? We do not know, my friends, because the scriptures don't tell us, but they do tell us that God spoke to Joseph clearly, so clearly, get up, take your wife and child, get up, get up, clear direction for sure. A good friend of mine was sharing with some folks about her journey toward the priesthood and her sense of call into this life of ordination, which came later in her life, and she was somewhat hesitant to give a lot of detail, I mean, it's kind of a personal story, and she wasn't sure how her listeners would receive it. Plus, as she spoke it out loud, it sounded kind of crazy. I don't remember her saying specifically that God came to her in a dream, like we hear in Matthew's Gospel, but it was something that sounded kind of that absurd. And she said, you know, maybe I would have felt more comfortable 
I mean, it wasn't like God put it on a billboard or something. To which one of her listeners said, would you have felt better then? If God had put on a sign on the side of the road, come to me, serve me as a priest in my church, would that have actually made you feel better? Would that have sounded less crazy? Indeed, God's response and engagement with us can sound absurd. I am delighted, though, to know that some of you have begun to listen. You have shared with me how it is that you have heard God's voice, and you have had this clear sense of what God was inviting you into, how God was directing you, is directing you. It delights me to hear you tell me of this, for you know that I will receive it, and I can hear with you God's direction for you. Indeed, God's voice can sound eerily like our own, but much more true, much more grounded, much more spacious, much more fruitful. It requires us, indeed, to create a, pl a place of receptivity, to discipline ourselves to listen. Because I wonder why it is God wouldn't continue to speak to God's creation. We read in the scriptures that cover thousands of years of God's activity. It's been thousands of years since Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead. And so it is that God does continue to speak. And if God is speaking to you in a voice that sounds similar to yours and you don't listen to it, what way would you feel more confident? A handwritten note? Would that make you feel more confident? Maybe a text message or a tweet? Would that feel more reliable? If God called you on the phone, would that make more sense? Or maybe you want a dissertation or an academic paper or a journal article. You get my point, I'm sure. It seems ridiculous, and if you were to open up a magazine and hear God speaking directly to you with words of your name, you would probably shut it and call the doctor because we all know that that's not how it happens. And yet, and yet the truth does come to us time and again. Even in those forms, in a kind of gentle way, God speaks to us in a way that we can learn to hear. God is in relationship with us always. So how is it that we tune our ears to listen? How do we remove the clutter within ourselves to listen? As we have endured the 2020 year, with so much pulled away that filled our lives, indeed, we got to hear all kinds of things that we didn't know were in the mix of society and in our life. This happened on a very general societal level. It also happened on a personal level to so many of us. I don't know anyone who was left out of this. And as we come into the 2021 year, I don't know about you, but I find myself in the hopes of this uh, vaccine and the recognition with the new um, president, president and his leadership that there are going to be possibilities of new things to happen, and I don't know what those are. And I want to keep the goodness that I've come to know in God through this tumultuous and tragic 2020 year. How is it that we can create the space within each of ourselves to respond to what it is God wants to share with us. I was scrolling through some written article and it had little comments that people had um, sent in uh, about things that they had learned or how they're going into the 2021 year. And this one woman um, said, it was just about five lines long, she said, my daughter turned me on to the, the How to Be 10% Happier app, which is really about meditation. And I don't want to be one of those crazy people that tells everybody that they should meditate, but I just have to say, everyone should meditate. I loved how this had provided for her the space for listening. That the good news was something she couldn't not say. She might sound a little crazy like all those other people that sound crazy, but how could she not tell you? This has changed her life. It has reoriented her. It has helped her to hear what the divine is saying to her. It's opening up space for her life to be more rooted and more fruitful. So it is with the gospel. So it is with Jesus. So it is with God coming among us, reminding us that, yes, I want to be in relationship with you. 
from the time that I walked in the garden with Adam and Eve to the time when I walked among you as Jesus Christ, I am in relationship with you. As the Holy Spirit, I continue to be in relationship with you. Please, welcome me in. Perhaps one of the reasons we can be resistant or hesitant or just allow obstructions to come our way is that we're not quite sure what we'll hear. Maybe we're a little nervous of what God might say. We wonder what we'll do if we hear something that seems incomplete or maybe confusing or unsettling or unclear. Might Joseph have had that same emotional response? It seems not by the way that he spoke or way that it's accounted for in the Gospels, which, by the way, were written decades after this experience. And I think that that's probably true, that God speaks to us directly. Indeed, it might feel a little unsettling, but it's not usually confusing or harmful. Indeed, it's truth, wanting to live within us, and we can feel the truthfulness of it. It's invitation to bring us forward. That being said, there are times when we have hesitancy and maybe an element of doubt that we heard correctly. It could be an invitation that feels so large, even though it's small, can feel so large that we're unsure if we should move forward. Like maybe many of you in this week between Christmas and New Year's, I took some time off and I enjoyed the opportunity to listen to some um, podcasts that family and friends had recommended. One of them is called This Jungian Life, and there was an episode on doubt. And listening to these therapists that are trained in Carl Jung's principles, they were talking about the significance and value of doubt, how it is that it engages us in dimensions of what we're encountering and can help us consider what is before us. One of the people on this particular um, episode encouraged the listeners, what if you change the word doubt to dialogue? And so that is that this dialogue comes up within you. A question perhaps that says, is this the right way? What would make it the right way? What part of it is the right way? Why am I concerned about moving in this direction? What is it that I might be concerned about? Who might I be concerned about? That the doubt, if translated into dialogue, begins a conversation with us that can then strengthen us as we move forward, purifying and clarifying the true way. I liked this invitation. I thought it was helpful to considering how it is that God works with us and works in us and works through us and even reminding us of God's desire to be in dialogue with us. There are a couple of things that this brought to my attention. One is that God does indeed invite us into conversation and earlier this week in talking to some friends, they were recalling with me a particularly difficult time in my life and a particularly difficult person during that time and remembering how hard it was for me, they started to bash this other person, going on about this way and that way, and he did this and he did that, and la 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 la. And I thought, yeah, that was horrible. I remember how horrible that was. And I found a journal that reminds me of how horrible that was. It was horrible. But I didn't feel inclined to join them in the bashing. For this particular experience, hell no, place in my life any longer, at least not in the way that it had before. I couldn't quite say, oh, it's okay, because it actually really wasn't okay. It was really not okay. How was it, I thought, that I can speak into this new re reality of my life while also recognizing that that was hell, that was horrible. I found myself saying, you know, God just reminds me that God can work with anybody or anything. And yet that didn't quite feel like the completeness of the thought. Only later, in a quiet moment, in that liminal space, did God say to me, Whitney, what part, I, well, I need you to remember that I redeem everything. What part of that do you not understand? 
And I replied, the every part. This is the dialogue. Indeed, God redeemed that tragic and horrible time. The pain that I went through, the suffering that was very real, God redeemed it and made something good come from it so that that past holds no power any longer. In fact, all it does is remind me of God's redeeming power. Yes, God redeems everything. And I loved this, this question that God had to me after God made the statement, Whitney, remember that I redeem everything. What part of that do you not understand? And my response was the every part. How is it that I can grow to learn to trust that God redeems everything? God is in dialogue with us, wants to be in dialogue with us. And why wouldn't God want to be? For you know what it's like to be in relationship with another and your desire to be in a relationship with another. And how does that carry itself out? In dialogue. That's where it is. It's in the give and the take and the conversation and in the exchange. That's exactly where it is. And God longs for that with us, with you, with me. God says, let me be in relationship with you. Let's talk together. Let's walk in the garden like I did at the very beginning. Let me come into your midst, just into your household, in the routine of your day. Let's be in conversation. And as that relationship grows, God learns how much God can share with us, how much God can reveal to us, and what God is longing to do in the world. For I see from this gospel lesson where Joseph hears the angel of the Lord speak to him, a man who could be trusted, so that when God said, get up and go, get up and go, God knew that Joseph would listen, that Joseph would respond. And so God gained strength in trusting Joseph more and more and more with what God wanted to reveal. Yes, this is what happens in a relationship with God, because it's what happens in a relationship with each of us with one another. As more is shared, we see if more can be shared. Consider, if you will, people you have sought to mentor or to coach. You actually want someone who will respond to you. Why bother? Why bother with someone who is going to throw it away to disregard your counsel? I can tell you that I have availed myself of good mentors and coaches and therapists and spiritual directors. Over all my years, I have sought to sit at the feet of someone who does life in a way that say, I say, oh yes, tell me how you do that. And to a one, to an every one, I can tell you, they have given me instruction, which I have on occasion said, really, that, that's hard. I don't know how to do it. My honesty usually engenders in them a desire to teach me. They give me direction, and I go through the motions. I tell you the truth, I go through the motions until what they have imparted to me becomes a part of me. One of my favorite stories on myself is working with an executive coach. This was just like three, three years ago, I think, or so. I wanted to learn how to be non-defensive. Um, over the years, I had found that certain strategies had worked for me in making things happen in my life and in my environment and in my work and in my home, and they were not working so well. So I received the guidance of an executive coach, and she was going to train me in how to be non-defensive. So in one of the exercises, she said, let's do a role play. Well, I like role plays. I think they're fun. So I was game. Yes, let's do a role play. She said, I'm going to say something to you, and I want you to respond non-defensively. I said, great. Now, later I learned that her intention with what she was going to say was to get my reptile brain to be the first to respond. So she started off, Whitney, I do not like your sermon. I don't know where you got off saying that. Who gives you the authority to say things like that? And then she was quiet and waited for me. And I sat there. I was supposed to respond, and I was coming up with nothing. I couldn't even think of where to start. I knew this was an exercise, so I didn't feel really threatened, but I couldn't even pretend to feel threatened and then pretend to respond. So I was really out of my league here. I said, you know, after like a minute of silence, she said, okay, let's do a different one. I said, okay, great, let's do, let's do a different one. She says, Whitney, 
You're a terrible mother. I didn't know what to say. How could I respond to her in a non-defensive way on this particular very powerful piece of my life? So after again, another few seconds, maybe another minute of silence, I said, you know what, I need a sentence starter. Like, I don't, I don't even know where to start on these things. I don't even know what the first words to say that might like get me going here. Can you give me some sentence starters? And she said, yes, I can. And so she gave me some sentence starters and I jotted them down in my book so that I could return to them because the Lord knew and I knew that I was gonna have plenty of time to practice them between this visit with her and the next one. And indeed I did. So don't you know I was excited to show up at our next appointment to show her that I had practiced my sentence starters and things had turned out differently. And I was gonna give her an account of how I did it. And it did, I told her. I said, you know, how's this? And she said, that is pretty good. It's actually much better than before. And you left off a part. And so she coached me further. My life has been changed by this woman. In fact, she wrote a book, and I'm going to tell you about it later. Because things in my life are different now. Maybe you've noticed. I don't know. But you can give me feedback later, and I'll respond non-defensively. Indeed, though, it's beautiful to feel the transformation happen. My emphasis in telling you this story is how foreign it felt to me how much I needed her direct guidance, how I went back to her with my practice for her feedback, and how I, I revisited and, um, and did it again. This is what God longs for in us. Come to me, God says. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's what God wants for us. God does not berate us. God wants a willing learner, and God will foster again and again our growth drawing us more deeply into relationship with God so that we know the riches of his abundant grace. This is what we're invited into. And so it is that I sound as crazy as the woman whose comment I read earlier who says, I don't want to sound like one of those people, but I am. Me too. How is it that you can allow God to be in relationship with you this year? I can tell you some good practices that will make it happen. You might not believe it, you might think it's ridiculous, but even going through the motions will change you. I hope this year to provide for you, through St. Stephen's, opportunities for spiritual growth. Indeed, one of the most easy and accessible ways is to spend a few minutes in silence, usually with the scriptures, with God. Just sit there. 20 minutes is at most. You don't even have to start at 20. Start at 10. Because God, in God's generosity, wants to show up for you, will show up for you, as you sit and receive. And the fruit of a life that is shaped by God will be that that the whole world will welcome. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit, and it's what the Spirit brings out in us as we allow ourselves to be shaped by the Spirit's work in and through us. Remember, in Matthew's Gospel, and in Luke's also, that Jesus says to his disciples, and thus to us, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks the door will be opened. He reminds us, why wouldn't your, God, your Father in heaven give you good gifts if you would do at least that much for your children? God longs for this too. And before these words in Matthew's Gospel, we are reminded of Jesus' other teaching. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Don't waste your time. God says, I'm not going to waste mine. If we are willing to receive, we will receive. If we're not willing to receive, then God sits there waiting to give. For God will not give to us what we cannot recognize. God will not give to us what we cannot receive and live into. God will not overwhelm us, but give us just that next good gift that we need to live in him. So I invite you in this 2020 year to prepare yourselves. Prepare yourself to receive what God has in store. Cultivate your receptivity to the spirit for the fullness of your life and for the goodness of the whole world. 
I am committed in this 2021 year to providing for you these opportunities. And I will say, I need your feedback. I need you to show up for them, to tell me what you're learning, what you want to learn more of or instead, what it is, where your questions are, so that I can then give you something more, something different that will help bring that about. I need this dialogue and this conversation, for to offer things without your feedback makes no relationship at all. And this is what the church is about, cultivating our contemplation, not just our action, so that we collectively can hear what God has in store for St. Stephen's and know how it is that God is calling us through this pandemic, through the crises of the world, into being his good news in Ridgefield and beyond. For God's grace expands way beyond us and will not find boundaries just in our little town, but even beyond us in ways we do not even know. We know this, we know this, we know this through scripture time and again, and if you read it simply with an eye toward God, desiring to relate to God's creation, you will see over and over again God's faithful pursuit of us. And it is in that that we are made more. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he says what it is that he prays for, for that church. He prays that they will receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Yes, that's what I want for you too. That they will have an enlightened heart. That's my prayer for you too. That they will have hope. Yes, I want that for you. That they will have the riches of God's glorious inheritance, riches that moth and rust do not consume and thieves do not break in and steal. These are riches of God that go beyond what we can imagine. I want that for you too. And he also wants for the church in Ephesus an immeasurable greatness of God's power because Paul knows that God has this to give. And indeed, my friends, I'm right there with him, that crazy man. I'm right there with him to say the same. God has this to give us. All we need to do is open ourselves to receive it. Let us commit ourselves to that in this 2021 year. Amen. and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The word of God lives among us and within us to strengthen and inspire. With confidence, let us pray to our God 
the Father with words of hope and faith, saying, Hear our prayer. Let us pray for the Church of Jesus Christ. God of light, empower your ministers and people to proclaim your gospel fearlessly wherever darkness obscures human dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the nations of the world. God of peace, in your world we recognize the abundance of your enduring love. Grant to this world, marked by division and strife, a thirst for justice perfected in selfless love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the hungry and the abandoned. God of life, strengthen us to serve with joy those who experience the darkness of suffering. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all educators. God of wisdom, in your word we hear the proclamation of your truth. Enlighten all who teach with your spirit of knowledge and understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for this community of faith. God of grace, give us hearts filled with love, voices to speak your praise, and lives conformed to the image of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the sick and dying. God of glory, in your word we receive the promise of life beyond weakness and sorrow. We pray especially for Anne, Eve, Justine, Tracy, Deborah, John, Sarah, Sandy, Wendy, Jay, Tim, Jack, Larry, Madeline, Lance, Ellie, Fred, Joel, Ashley, and Melissa. Heal those who call upon you in faith and reveal your light to those in the shadow of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I invite you to name, either silently or aloud, those for whom you pray. May the God who sustains us support all of those who are on the front lines of providing for people's health and safety, medical personnel, first responders of all kinds, employees who serve in the chain of providing food and medical supplies, mental health professionals, government officials, and others known to you alone. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. May the God who reigns with mercy empower all those working to alter systems of power and structures of authority so that all, so that all of God's children know the freedom and security of our shared humanity. Lord, in your mercy. Your prayer. Creator of all, you have not abandoned your creation, but have made your dwelling with us in Christ. Hear your faithful people and grant us the blessings of your mercy. For we make this prayer in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to turn and share a sign of God's peace. I want to say thank you to those who are helping in this morning's worship virtually, Andy for reading the scripture and Jim for leading us in the prayers. And I also want to say thank you to those that participated in our diocesan worship um, last week on December 27th on that first Sunday of Christmas. I hope you tuned in. It was really a delight, um, and I loved seeing our choir members, Jack Herr, Tom Carr, and Chris Fallon singing in the anthem that was during the worship service that day um, and waiting for their faces to appear on the screen and to find them yet again. So thank you, Jack and Tom and Carr, for representing St. Stephen so beautifully in that service last week. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O oh Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Twin to the little lamb. Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb. Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a cow. The tail as big as a kite said the little lamb to the shepherd boy do you hear what I hear ringing through the sky shepherd boy do you the shepherd boy to the mighty king do you know what i know in your palace warm mighty king do you know what i know a child a child shivers in the cold let us bring silver and gold let us bring him silver and gold said the king to the people
As we gather here at the Eucharistic table, we remember the death of Sue Jong Park Zabuski, the life of Sue Jong Park Zabuski, the mother of Annette Robertson who died just this past week. May she go from strength to strength in God's service. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth, because you gave Jesus Christ, your only son, to be born for us, who by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit was made perfect man of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother, so that we might be delivered from the bondage of sin and receive power to become your children. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep peace. Alleluia. Come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more, you who have been here often, you who have not been for a long time, you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here, sustaining us for the work we are called to in him. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch or keep? Of justice, justice and, and peace, peace. We, we give, give you peace thanks peace that in the sacrament of the altar you assure us of your presence within us and within the body of Christ, the faithful through all the generations. Grant that we who have witnessed anew these holy mysteries, though unable to receive the physical elements of the sacrament, may be moved by your indwelling spirit ever more fully to embody your holy and life-giving presence reshaping in your likeness the world around us until we are gathered at last into the fullness of your glorious and eternal presence 
Through Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. May the God, my God the Father, judge all merciful, make us worthy of a place in his kingdom. Amen. May God the Son, coming among us in power, reveal in our midst the promise of his glory. Amen. Amen. May God the Holy Spirit make us steadfast in faith, joyful in hope, and constant in love. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. the dismissal, I want to invite you again to join me in just a few minutes as we consider what it means to be the body of Christ here at St. Stephen's for the goodness of the world. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.